Man's Face, starring Betty Davis, Conrad Veidt, Osa Masson, and Warren Williams. The Gulf Screen Guild Theater. And now, here is your host, the director of the star's own theater, Roger Pryor. Good evening, everyone. The Gulf Oil Companies and your neighborhood good golf dealer welcome you to the Gulf Screen Guild Theater. Tonight, we're bringing you a most unusual story. Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's brilliant success, A Woman's Face. Our stars, Betty Davis, Osa Masson, Conrad Veidt, and Warren William. Now, in just a minute, Oscar Bradley's music will signal the beginning of our play. Meanwhile, a man in your own neighborhood, right in your own home community, offers this helpful suggestion. Your good golf dealer suggests that you drop by tomorrow and let him help you make your car last longer. He can do it through his economical car saver services. He can help prevent excessive engine wear by flushing the dirty worn oil from your crankcase and refilling it with the proper seasonal grade of oil. He can replace gear lubricants with fresh new lubricants. He can give your chassis and body the thorough protection of a Gulflex registered lubrication job. Yes, you can rely on your Gulf dealer's experience and upon his interest in helping keep a neighbor's car rolling. You can depend on the fine Gulf products he sells. So stop tomorrow at the good golf dealers in your own neighborhood. Care for your car, for your country. And now, A Woman's Face, starring Betty Davis as Anna Holm, Osa Masson as Viri Siegert, Conrad Veidt as Torsten Baring, and Warren William as Dr. Gustav Siegert. The scene is a crowded courtroom in Scandinavia, all eyes are fastened on the defendant, a strikingly beautiful woman. The charge is murder. The magistrate summons the prisoner to stand before the bar of justice. Will the prisoner now give her testimony? You may tell your story, Anna Holm. I was born in the north. We were very poor. My mother died when I was three, so my recollections of her are very dim. I remember my father better... He drank a great deal. One night when I was five, he was too drunk to know that he had set fire to the curtains in my room. When I recovered consciousness, I was in a hospital. I heard a voice cold and terrifying. Nothing more can be done. The child's face will be hideously scarred all her life. How much better it would be if she had died. Yes, it would have been better. If I had died that night. For always after that, I had to live with my horrible, grotesque face. Well, the years passed, and the time came when I must support myself. I applied everywhere. Miss Holm, I don't know why you'd even think we'd give you a job here. Your face. Well, it must be obvious that your appearance would distress our customers. You are one of the unemployables, Miss Holm. And the sooner you resign yourself, the better. On my 20th birthday, I came to a decision. The world was against me. I would be against the world. I took a small legacy just left me by my uncle and came here. Opened a small roadhouse on the edge of town. The roadhouse was merely a blind, of course. My real business was blackmail. Yes, pretty little wives are silly little fools. They even sold their jewels to pay me for their indiscretions. After a while, I had enough money to, to buy anything I wanted, anything except, except love. And knowing that no man would ever look at me with any feeling stronger than pity, I hated men. Then I met Torsten Baring. He had been entertaining a small party of guests at my roadhouse. There was some trouble about the check, and I was summoned to my office. How do you do? You are the proprietor? Yes. I'm Torsten Barry. I have heard the name. It is a most notorious one. Oh, I too have heard of Anna Holm. But no matter. Your minister tells me that my name does not entitle me to credit here. I am not operating this place for the benefit of names, even the name of Barry. Why do you hold your hand to your face? 
That has nothing to do with the business of the moment. You have something in your eye, perhaps. Come here, under the light. Let me look. No. But I insist. Please, there is nothing. There, now take your hand away. Come, come, let me see. Very well, Mr. Baring, since you insist. And since I have heard you are a great connoisseur of beauty, look at my face. Take a good look. Thank you. Now hold very still, Miss Holmes. Now you know why I cover my face. Oh, yes. Even the smallest particle of dust in one's eye can be very painful. You are laughing at me. I'll have it out in just a moment. This is a trick I learned from a friend of mine. She, too, has beautiful eyes. Beautiful. There we are. Does it feel better? Stop pretending. You know there was nothing in my eye. I hate pity. You are proud and beautiful, Anna Holm. And perhaps the answer of some kindly deity to my prayer. Yes, together we might accomplish great things. There I hope that we may be friends. Perhaps more than friends. If you will accept my sincere admiration... Oh, nice. Do come in. Mr. Baring, no one saw me come here. That's a pity. It would have added to my reputation. As what? As a most fortunate man. Please, your court. I'll keep it on if you don't mind. But I do mind. Last night you were the proprietor. Tonight you are a guest. And we barings have a reputation for chivalry toward our guests. Do sit down. Thank you. Now... Now, what sort of dirty work do you want me to do for you? But, my dear Miss Horn... You sent me your invitation this morning for only one purpose. I see no reason for pretending any other. Might we not argue about that, uh, perhaps over a glass of liqueur? No, I don't drink anymore. It's too dangerous in my vocation. Tell me, have you ever read this book? The Love Letters of Chopin and George Sand? Yes, I've read every love letter that was ever published. And that's what I think of love letters. I like you, Anna Holm. Do you? Yes. Because we are kindred souls. Two proud, yet wretched people. By the way, Anna, if you are interested in love letters, you might be interested in these. They were written by a Mrs. Seagert... I think she would give a great deal to have them back. Might I suggest you call on Mrs. Seagate tonight? Silence. Silence in the court. All right, Mr. Prosecutor. Miss Horn, isn't it true... That you were madly, insanely infatuated with Torsten Baring? I loved him. You loved him because he was the first man who ever told you that you were beautiful. Even though you knew he was lying. Yes. Yes, but don't Just you understand... Just a moment, uh, Mr. Prosecutor. Now, let's get on with the trial, Miss Holm. When was it you made the acquaintance of Dr. Gustav Sigurd? It was that night after my meeting with Mr. Baring. I took the letters written by Vera Sigurd. And you went to the doctor's house to return them? Uh, yes. I had decided that a suitable reward for their return would be 10,000 kroner. You see, they were quite incriminating. Mrs. Seagert received me in the drawing room. But I didn't that much money, Miss Hong. I couldn't possibly give you 10,000 kroner. You have jewelry worth much more, Mrs. Seagert. You wouldn't take my jewelry. It's from my husband. Whom I love more than anything in the world. That is not the way you described him in these letters to another man. Give me those letters. I don't believe I would try to snatch them if I were you. Such silly letters. What do you know about love in that miserable soul of yours? Can you imagine loving a man so completely that you surrender everything you have just to be near him, just to have him near you? That is love as I know it. Love as you know it. How could anyone ever love you? You are ugly, horrible, loathsome. Ah! Get me oh. your jewels. Hurry up. I've wasted quite enough time. Where are you? Vera, darling. 
I'm back. Who is that? My husband. Quick, please. He mustn't find you here. I didn't know he said you. All know. right, but don't you try any tricks. I won't. I promise you I won't. Close the door. He's coming. See that you don't forget. Where are you, Vera? In here, Gustav. Oh. Well, I got back from the hospital much sooner than I expected. A very interesting case, but really quite simple when I got to the operation. Oh, you must be very tired. No, not really. Oh, why don't you go up to bed? And I'll bring you up some hot chocolate. Nonsense. In the first place, I'm not sleepy. And in the second place... Listen, what's that? Oh, what was what, Costa? That noise. I didn't hear anything. Then you're deaf as a post. It was in there, in the reception room. Let's have a look. Oh, no, Gustav. Oh, don't go in there. Uh, it, might, it might be thieves. Who's in there? Speak up. Gustav, please. Where's that light switch? There we are. Well, we do have a visitor. A lady snake thief who's had the misfortune to knock over that pedestal in the dark. I advise you not to move, miss. I can't move, Dr. Seagert. If that's any comfort to you, I twisted my ankle as I fell. Call the police, Vera. The police? Yes, the police. Oh, but darling, she seems so miserable. And we are so happy, you and I. Why, why couldn't we let her go? Really, dear, you do get sentimental at times. I know it, darling, but maybe it's just because next week is our anniversary. Please, for me, why don't you bandage her ankle and send her away? Well, I'll see you get the bandages, and I'll think it over. Oh, thank you, Gustav. I'll get them right away. Now, Miss Sneak Thief, let's turn on this lamp and have a look at that ankle. Hello, what's this? Take that light off my face. When did that happen? Mind your own business. My dear young woman, didn't you know that is my business? I'm a plastic surgeon. Keep your hands away from my face. You know, it would be a shame to send a scar like that to jail. This happened when you were a child, I imagine. A rather beautiful child. Oh, that's a pity. You're breaking my heart. You're nearly, not nearly as tough as you make out. Here, I want to show you something. Take a look at this book of photographs. It's full of interesting people. This one. How do you like it? Oh, I... Not very pretty, is he? The scars are as deep as yours. Quite hopeless, wouldn't you say? Now turn the next page. To the next picture. I... Turn it. Well, I... There. What do you think of him? Why, he's very handsome. The very same man, but completely restored. I performed that little miracle last March. I could perform another one on you. You couldn't, Doctor. No? Not my face. No? What's your name? Anna Holm. All right, Miss Holm. I'm going to let you choose your own punishment and possible regeneration. What do you mean? The choice is yours. Will you go to jail and sit behind bars and think about your sins? Or will you go to my hospital and my operating table to be released half a year hence? Inwardly the same, but outwardly completely transformed. You don't mean... You don't mean I might be... be beautiful. I warn you, it'll mean pain, agony, weeks and months Months are nothing. I've endured pain and agony for years. Why do you want me to do this? Why? Because I'm obsessed by a great and consuming curiosity, Miss Holland. I want to make an experiment. You are quite obviously a wicked woman. I want to find out if that wickedness is in your face or in your soul. I want to see if my knife will create a beautiful woman with a human heart or a lovely Frankenstein. Come, what do you say? I warn you, if the operation isn't a success... You may be worse off. Worse off than what? There are no shadings of misery when a woman has a face as revolting as mine. You give me my choice, Dr. Siegert. There is no choice for me. Take me to your hospital and do what you will. Oh, I would offer my face, my heart, and even my soul to your knife. Just to have one man look at me and say, I love you. And so the curtain falls on the first act of A Woman's Face. And in this brief intermission, we'd like to tell you about a great new program that Gulf brings to the people of America starting next Sunday evening. It's the famous program, We the People. But it's a new We the People, more important 
more thrilling, more inspiring than ever before, because today, America is at war. This new Gulf show tells the fascinating and varied story of We the People at War. Through this program, you'll meet the men of the United States Navy, of the Air Force. You'll hear from men who fought side by side with MacArthur, and from your own neighbors. Next week, for instance, you'll learn of a woman who gladly turned her home into a miniature arsenal of democracy, where she works side by side with her husband at a power lathe. You'll meet a factory worker from Cleveland, Ohio, whose personal sacrifice is one answer to the question we're all asking, how can I help? Don't miss this new series offered by Gulf as a service to you and as an additional contribution to our war effort. Starting next Sunday, we the people will speak of great sacrifices, of heroic and adventurous deeds, of ways in which we can all work together toward victory. Be sure to tune in when Gulf brings you another new frontier of radio, another great program, the story of We the People at War. Now the curtain of the Gulf Screen Guild Theater is ready to rise on the second act of A Woman's Face. Adapted for radio by Charles Taswell and starring Betty Davis as Anna Holm, Warren William as Dr. Gustav Siegert, Conrad Veit as Torsten Baring, and Osa Masson as Vera Siegert. The scene is again the courtroom where Anna is on trial for murder. According to the sworn testimony of the defendant, she met Dr. Gustav Siegert who offered by means of plastic surgery to transform her scarred face into a thing of beauty. Her appearance here on the witness stand is a testimony to Dr. Secret's skill. Now, suppose... Yes, Mr. Prosecutor. I uh, wish to ask Miss Holm a question, please. Yes? Did you, Miss Holm, at any time during the six months spent in his hospital, did you realize that Dr. Sagert had fallen in love with you? No, I did not know. Didn't you know that he divorced his wife? Yes, but not on account of me. He had learned of her indiscretions with other men. And it was you who told him about her? No, he found out for himself. Oh, indeed. Permit me to say... One that... moment, Mr. Prosecutor. Let us get on with the witness testimony. Tell us, Miss Holm, what happened when you left Dr. Sigurd's hospital? I went to Thorsten Baring's apartment. I wanted him to be the first to see me. The look in his eyes was worth all the months of pain in Dr. Siegert's hospital. The hours passed. We talked of this and that as lovers do. And as the light faded, we sat in the dusk and crossed and played for me. This is called Vavavat Mal, an old weaving song. It's supposed to represent the movement of the shuttle. I heard it first up at my dear uncle's estate at Forza. It's nice, Thorsten. So is my dear uncle. Rich? Oh, very. Who gets it when he dies? My uncle has a grandson, aged four. A charming little brat. Rather frail. If the child lives, he inherits everything. And if the child doesn't live, I'll be a rich man, Anna. Anna? Yes? There are falls on my uncle's estate. Very swift. Very dangerous. I had a letter from my uncle this morning asking me to recommend a new governess for the boy. You don't know anybody, do you? No. But yes, I think you do, my partner. No, I said no, Thorsten. And I said yes. Yes, my darling. Yes. Thorsten had his way, and I went to Forster to be the boy's governess. The child's name was Lars Eric. He was a nice little boy. And I tried hard to steel my heart against him. Regina! Regina, have you gone? No, Lars Eric, I'm right here. What do you want? You forgot to hear me say my prayers. You can say them without me, can't you? Sometimes I forget the word. Please. Well, all right. 
Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my... My... My what, Miss Anna? My soul to keep. Oh, yes. If I should die before I wake... The week slipped by. I found myself kissing the child goodnight. Every night when I tucked him into his bed. Thorsten wrote me often, but I had nothing to report to him. When he arrived in Forza for his uncle's birthday party, he was very angry. There was a dance that evening, and I found that one of the guests was Dr. Secret. Pardon me, may I have this dance? Doctor? May I? Why, of course. Thank you. Well, you can't imagine how relieved I am. Relieved? Yes. I've been looking fearfully in the papers each morning, expecting to read of some outrageous crime committed by a beautiful brunette. And now I find... You find what? Perhaps you could tell me. Oh, no, you're the expert. Turn on your light, Doctor. Unfortunately for humanity, the light hasn't been invented, which would let us look into that interesting heart of yours. But I can, perhaps, issue a preliminary encouraging bulletin. Encouraging? Yes. Let's say, tentatively, let's say that the patient has had the intelligence to hide herself in a place where her past life can't tempt her. And the courage to go where she can start a new life. Your diagnosis is wrong, doctor. I'm not on the side of the saints, not yet. You've made a good start. Grandfather Barring thinks you quite a wonderful person. And he tells me that little Lars Eric loves you. Shall we talk about something else? What, for instance? Well, well, about you, Doctor. But how can I talk about me without talking about you? You see, ever since those months you were in my hospital, I've thought about uh, us. Doctor Secret, please. Anna, what's the matter? No, nothing, nothing. Only, only see, they're starting the weaving dance. We must join in or Grandfather Baring will be disappointed. Come. Come, Doctor. At the first moment, I knew that Dr. Seagate loved me. And somehow I knew that all the while I had loved him. I left the party and went up to the tower room. It was there Torsten Baring found me. He had seen me go up the stairs and had followed. So you crawled off to hide, did you? The handsome Dr. Seeger has changed my eagle into a dove. Let go, my aunt, Thorsten. You're hurting me. You don't know me, Anna. No one knows me. The time is at hand. And I shall be greater than any man has ever been or ever will be. You are insane. Am I? Do you think I let a child stand between me and all that wealth? Wealth is power. And I know how to use that power. Let me go. The world belongs to the devil, Anna. And I know how to serve him. Thorsten, please... But you are no use to me. All the hard, shining brightness of you has gone. I don't need you. I can do it myself. Yes? Do you hear? I can do it myself. Thorsten! Thorsten! And so it was I learned that Thorsten Baring was stark, staring mad. I hurried after him. I stopped at the gun room for a pistol I had seen there. Then I ran down the stairs to the great entrance hall. Suddenly, I heard the shrill peal of sleigh bells and the beat of racing hoofs. I saw a sleigh flash down the drive. It was driven by Torsten, and he had last Eric with him. Another sleigh was at the door, and I set off in pursuit. It seemed like hours, although it was only minutes until I saw the sleigh I was following. And even over the bells, I could hear the roar of the falls. Faster, faster. And up ahead was Torsten, laughing like a demon and lashing his horses to a frenzy. I saw then that I would be too late, that Torsten would reach the falls ahead of me. I took out my pistol and held it ready. A moment later, he pulled up his horses at the brink of the falls. Come, Lars Eric, close to the edge of the cliff and see the rapids. I'm afraid, Uncle Torsten. There's nothing to hurt you. See, I'll stand just behind you and hold you tight. Torsten! Lars Eric! Look, Uncle Torsten, there's Miss Anna. Never mind, Lars Eric. Look, look, see how far down it is to the water. Torsten, let the child go. She's got a gun, Uncle Torsten. What's the matter with her? I said let the child go, Torsten. Put that gun away, Anna. 
You don't dare! Shoot! Uncle Torsten! Uncle Torsten! Rosanna, you killed Uncle Torsten! You killed him! Order. Order. That is how Torsten Baring died. It was my hand that killed him. The prosecuting attorney says it was murder. But may it please the court, I'm glad I did. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. I don't think we'll have to wait much longer for a verdict, Anna. But, Gustav, listen to me. You can't love me. You're crazy. You're a romantic fool. I haven't changed from what I was. You couldn't marry me. Have I asked you to marry me? No, and you mustn't. Why not? Because I want to get married. I want to have a home and children and go to market and cheat the grocer and fight the landlord. Oh. <laughs> well, in that case, it's very simple. There's a wonderful market just round the corner from where we're going to live. It has a grocer who likes to be cheated. And I guarantee our future landlord will fight at the drop of a hat. Good stuff. You're making it very difficult for me. Because I love you, Anna. You do, don't you? You know you're the first man who ever said that to me and really meant it. You have made a great mistake, Gustav. I'm going to be one of those silly wives who keep asking you to say it over and over again all the days of our life. Thank you, Betty Davis, Osa Masson, Conrad Veidt, and Warren William for your superb performances. And to Oscar Bradley for a great score. You've brought our Gulf Screen Guild season to a brilliant conclusion. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Jean Herschel, president of the Motion Picture Relief Fund, has asked Betty Davis to say a few words. Roger. Ladies and gentlemen, in Hollywood, we are proud of our long and happy association with Gulf, and we sincerely hope that this association will continue for many years. We have always sort of considered the Screen Gull Theater our own theater. And in return for our performances on this stage, Gulf has contributed generously to our Motion Picture Relief Fund. This fund has made possible a home to provide for the less fortunate members of our industry who can no longer take care of themselves. A few years ago, that home was just a dream. Now it is a reality, nearing completion in the beautiful San Fernando Valley. So, on behalf of the motion picture industry, our sincere thanks to the Gulf people who have made all this possible. Thank you, Betty. It's been swell working with all of you this season. You've helped to make this one of the best series we've ever had. And speaking for Gulf, I'd like to thank you. And so, until we meet again, ladies and gentlemen, this is Roger Pryor speaking for your neighborhood good Gulf dealer and saying, Good night, everyone. Don't forget, next Sunday, same time, same station, Gulf brings you the fascinating new program telling the story of We the People at War. Tune in to the first of this inspiring series, showing that this is everybody's war. Meet the men from the Army, from the Navy, the men and women of the home front, courageous Americans who are making sure that when We the People speak, our enemies around the world will heed them. Don't miss this new Gulf series featuring Oscar Bradley and his music. Beginning next Sunday, same time and station, listen for We the People. Betty Davis will soon be seen in In This Our Life, a Warner Brothers picture. Conrad Veidt in Nazi Agent, a Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer production. Warren Williams' latest is The Lone Wolf in Scotland Yard, a Columbia picture. And Osa Masson will soon appear in 20th Century Fox's Iceland. But Easton speaking, this is the Columbia Broadcasting System.